part of what we've been doing is working with schools uh, and working with neighborhoods and public works to then develop a program where people observe dragonflies. What we have been doing with uh, the communities that we've been working with is we've been developing site-specific guides, so a field guide, where on one side you've got a, a photograph and on the other side you've got a description. And so this is something that uh, people that are recording data can go out and they take this in uh, with them into the field. What's really, really satisfying about this particular research for me, and I think what sets it aside from uh, a lot of the citizen science in other states, is it's not just people collecting data and sending data to scientists. It's people using the data. And so one of the things that emerged in this community we were working in is people started seeing some of the data showing dragonflies declining. And they were declining, we thought, because some of the vegetation had been mowed right around the ponds. And so the community looked at the data, and they're trying some ponds experimentally to see what will happen if they don't mow right to the edge of the pond. And when I heard that, I was just giddy. It's like, wow, that has never happened to me in my career. People actually using the data that they help collect to make a local decision about how water is managed. And one of the things that we saw, which still dumbfounds me, is that every classroom in the Verona, Wisconsin school district has curriculum built around these stormwater ponds. So teachers and administrators took the research that we were doing and started to build curriculum. And I think that's been the foothold, is anchoring the, the research and the citizen science in the schools and letting the schools be the source of expertise. In 1984, um, the DNR hired Carolyn Rumery Betts to put together a program where citizens would go out and get information about Wisconsin lakes. So the idea was that volunteers would collect data and we could look at this data long term and figure out if water clarity was improving, if it was declining, or if it was staying the same. When volunteers go out and collect that, that water clarity reading, they also collect the water color and the murkier clear, and then you can make the determination of what's impacting your water quality. So what volunteers were trained to do in 1986 when the program started was to go out and collect actual baseline data. So this data was used to, it, it could be used 50 years from now or 60 years from now. People could look back and say, well, this is what this lake was like before we had a lot of development on it. And the data that volunteers collect is used to make management decisions. Volunteers work really closely with our lakes coordinators. We have seven or eight lakes coordinators throughout the state. And they work with the, the lake coordinator to make management decisions on their lakes. So for a lot of lakes who are working on lake management plans, volunteers become involved in collecting more information on the lake. And then they kind of act as a liaison between the DNR and Extension Lakes and the people back home on the lakes. Uh, some other uses of the data that citizens collect, I don't know if any of you remember Mike Meyer. He's our, our loon researcher extraordinaire in the northern part of the state. And Mike has always been a great friend to Citizen Lake Monitoring. And he was probably the first researcher to say, I'm going to use citizen gathered data to make my research papers. And what he based his, uh, a lot of his re uh, loon research on was volunteer collected data. Uh, do citizen lake monitors have to do all of the things you talked about or can they just pick water clarity, for example? Or one other <laughs> no, we make them do everything. No, 
They can choose whatever they want to do. Water clarity monitoring is pretty simple and straightforward. We ask them to do it throughout the open water season and take a reading every 10 to 14 days if they're able. But as a volunteer, you can do it whenever you damn well want. <laughs> So uh, it seems like a disconnect between academia and citizens. What's a good way to find out about citizen science opportunities? There is a, a relatively newly formed, I think it's about two years old, uh, national network called the Citizen Science Association. Uh, and they publicize a lot of opportunities uh, and there is a website, Citizen Based Monitoring, that tells about various uh, citizen monitoring opportunities throughout the state. So you can always check with that to find out. My question is about uh, the training that uh, our volunteers go through to, to collect the data. How reliable is that data to pass on to somebody else? What we have set up now is that uh, to confirm an ID, you have to take a photo with a smartphone and then send us the photo. And so that way then people that do have the taxonomic expertise can do that ID. Uh, the field guides help get you really close. And so what I ask people to do is when they, when they send that to me is to give me the tentative ID. And that way, I can see how close they're getting to what it actually is. And with Citizen Lake Monitoring, when I first started in 1997, um, a lot of people questioned volunteer collected data. And I think we kind of worked through that. And now there is a sense that the data is, is good data. We do have a quality assurance program in place. So with the water chemistry volunteers, 10% of the chemistry volunteers collect a blank sample and a duplicate. And we regularly, we do that every year as part of the, the quality assurance project plan. For volunteers who are doing aquatic invasive species monitoring, all of those specimens are verified. And for people who are doing native aquatic plant or collecting Eurasian water milfoil or curly leaf pondweed, those specimens are all verified by Dr. Freckman. He's the, our statewide kind of botanist. He's, a, he's the person that we use to verify everything. OK, well, thank you very much, everybody. We've had a tremendous evening. Thank you, Sandy Wickman, and thank you, Robert Bohannon. Thank you. Thank you.